So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you have enjoyed the conference so far. Hope you had a, a lovely lunch. Again, I was just saying to someone earlier, the catering here has been 10 out of 10, so excellent work to HPCI for all of their managing of the event. Oh, wrong one. So, what I want to tell you is the work that's been carrying on out at Micropore Technologies, in particular, our work in API crystallization. So... Uh, it always has to lag, doesn't it? Um, so um, <laughs> now here is the slide here. Don't worry, this isn't to appease my vanity at all. Um, this is just here to just give you some perspective. So again, the company I represent is Micropore Technologies. I don't know if anyone here has heard of those before, but just to put a bit into context, um, Micropore Technologies, um, we'll go into more detail about this, by the way, mainly focuses on emulsification work and emulsification formulation sciences. However, a couple of years ago, someone actually used one of our specialized equipments, not for emulsification, but for crystallization, a completely different field. And as such, about 18 months ago, the company were like, this is looking promising, let's go someone in. Unfortunately for them, the person they ended up with was me. So um, my background is mainly in crystallography and traditional solid state chemistry, which is powders reacting at 1,000 degrees. So similar, but still rather different. And I came in to help utilize emulsion technology for crystallization. Okay, so uh, on the left-hand side is a basically a timeline of the company. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the main thing to go into is that we originally branched out from um, the University of Loughborough, and it was there that we, under Professor Richard Holdrich that our company's technology was developed using stainless steel membranes for emulsification. Again, stainless steel being something that can be antiseptic, can be chemically resistant, as well as surviving at high pressures. From that, from Loughborough, we actually then moved see, into the right-hand corner. This is the Wilton site in the northeast of England, Teesside. Now, we don't actually have a stand at the minute at this conference, but there is the NEPEC stand, which is the Northeast Precipitation in Chemistry. I highly recommend you have a speak to them. It's F11, and now that I've mentioned that, I can claim my commission of those guys. So, again, it's stainless steel micropore technology for emulsion formulation. That's where we originally started up from. And from this, we developed very specific technology for both lab R&D scale as well up to pilot plant scale and larger manufacturing output. That's what we originally worked in for. And we also, we don't just apply equipment, we also do formulation services as well from a variety of topics from microencapsulation, emulsification, again, lipid nanoparticles, which is in the COVID vaccine, a very hot topic at the minute, and surprise, surprise, crystallization. Now, this slide may look familiar for some people that were here yesterday at certain talks, so I don't want to repeat too much of it, as it was presented excellently yesterday, and I'm sure I can't top it. Um, this was submitted weeks ago, by the way. There's no copyright, but again, the main thing to take away from this slide is in that 90% of API, so pharmaceutical drugs, have low solubility. That is by far a heavy majority. And as such, there needs to be ways of trying to improve this solubility to make it better, as well as for usage for patients to take these APIs, as well as also for the manufacturing process as well, as having low solubility can indeed be difficult to work with. So Micropause Technologies aims in order to solve this problem by controlling the API crystallization process itself. One of the methods we've done this through is by uh, increasing the surface area. So increasing the surface area makes the, the material more reactive, have higher solubility, and in order to do this, one of the ways we've done this through API crystallization control is to have smaller crystals. So we've mentioned crystallization several times. Just for those whom, <laughs> whom um, may not know in the audience, what actually is a crystal? A, a very interesting question, and you'll find multiple definitions online. In this case, we've used the term that it's a assemblement of atoms, molecules, or ions, which have gathered together and have organized themselves in a regular repeating order in a three-dimensional pattern. So I'll use the screen. Okay, uh, it's not coming up, but anyways, so during the crystallization, um, the overall crystallization process, there are two key steps, that of nucleation and that of crystal growth. 
which is all about how we go from the singular atoms or molecules towards these three-dimensional crystals, these solids. Yep. Okay, so uh, going back to what we were saying earlier, so <laughs> nucleation and uh, growth, which are the two key main steps in the crystallization process. Again, as you can see here, we've got some definitions as well as equations. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into any detail of the equations and the mathematics. I'm sure you're all tired enough anyway from lunch. What I will talk about, however, is that in both cases, in both processes, it's supersaturation, which is an important concept to understand if we're going to control the crystallization process. So supersaturation, layman's terms, is when essentially you've added so much of a solid, i.e. in this case an API, to a solvent. You've added so much, it's exceeded a concentration that it can no longer dissolve further. So if you do add any more, it will remain as a solid in the solvent. There's the equation form, but I think what's much better is to have it as a nice graph. So here we have two things. One is the, the lower curve, which is the solubility curve. The amount of API, if it's below that amount, it will dissolve, it is soluble. Above the supersaturation curve, that's when you start to get solid precipitation. However, what we're interested in is the middle, the metastable region. And this is what we need to understand. This is what we need to understand and then control. Through controlling this region, then we can control supersaturation and determine the crystallization outcome to get the exact crystals we want in terms of size and morphology. So a bit of industrial um, understanding and background. So one of the key main methods used in industry for crystallization is batch cooling crystallization. It's been around for many, many years, very traditional. Essentially, you have your API in solvent, you heat it up to temperature for it to completely dissolve, you then controlly cool it back down again in order to get the desired crystal sizes and morphologies you desire. The problem with this is, is that, again, like a lot of batch processes, it can be difficult to repeat. Again, we'll move into the batch versus continuous debate later on. But again, this is one of the problems with this very traditional process. Another process which is very well known and very well defined is that of spray drying. Here you have your API in solvent, and then through an aerosol is introduced, the liquid is evaporated, and then your solid particulates are released via a spray nozzle in order to get your samples. Problem is in that a lot of spray drying techniques it is actually difficult through this methodology to try and control the size as well as the size distribution of your resulting crystals. So what are micropore tending to do? Well, micropore are tending to find a solution to this, an alternative to this for our patented stainless steel membrane technology. Now, our membrane technology has essentially been used, again, previously for emulsions, but acts as a means of controlling the introduction of one solvent into another. All right? Now, here we have our membrane, a particular uh, laser cutout of what we offer. Now, the pores themselves here, they can vary in sizes between 5 all the way up to 100 microns. The pitch, which is the distance between the pores, they can also be varied and tailored from 100 to 1,000 microns. Again, an emphasis on the flexibility on how you can control the introduction of one solvent to another to get a desired outcome. Now, this membrane technology has been fused with a crystallization technique, that of reverse antisolvent crystallization, and how these two have been combined together in order to achieve controlled crystallization. So the question is, what is reverse antisolvent crystallization? Well, it's the opposite of antisolvent crystallization, to put it in a nutshell. <laughs> so what is antisolvent crystallization? Well, that is essentially where you have an antisolvent, which is something that your material is insoluble in, and that you would add that to your API dissolved in solvents, and the idea would be the more antisolvent you add, supersaturation would slowly occur, and you would slowly get precipitation of your crystals. The problem is, is that this technique tends to result in slow supersaturation, which tends to favor crystal growth, giving you larger crystals. Again, larger crystals, lower surface area. So... We then do the opposite, which is we have our API in solvent. We then, through the pores, controlly add this to the antisolvent, which is the larger volume now. And because we're having API in solvent to the antisolvent, we find that we have instantaneous um, precipitation, instantaneous supersaturation, which favors nucleation, giving smaller crystals, smaller crystals, larger surface area, and that's what we're after. 
So here's some of our equipment that we tend to use at Micropore. Unfortunately, I couldn't physically bring any of these here. One of these pieces of equipment is worth more than my life to my company, believe it or not. Um, so unfortunately, pictures is all I can provide. But what is key is that the, the, these, this piece, these pieces of equipment here, they're all based on the exact same principles, the exact same technology. So the AXF Mini here, for example, if you can see it, that is used for one of our newest devices, actually, only came out about six or seven months ago. And that's mainly used for R&D research-based, labs-based um, production. And here we can see the sample sizing. You can get very small samples. So if you're doing work with very expensive APIs or very expensive products, RNA for example, again we are working with lipid nanoparticles and the COVID, then you don't want to make a lot of material. So again, this introduces highly controlled precision at a very small scale. But if you want to work with production scale and very cheap APIs, then you can go up the scale in order towards the AXF1 and the AXFN all using these exact same principles and methodology. The AXF1, just to give you um, an idea, from point to point is 12 centimeters. So a piece of equipment which has a very small industrial footprint, can fit in a suitcase, is essentially being able to produce 200 liters an hour of material. Again, easily all scalable, no moving parts, and all of this is stainless steel as well, so for an antiseptic environment, it's all applicable. I should have mentioned this at the start, but AXF stands for antiseptic cross flow, and that's what our main types of equipment. And here is essentially how it works. Unfortunately, I couldn't have a video demonstration as we had yesterday morning. Um, I believe my colleagues are too busy for such a thing. But here's essentially an AXF setup. Okay. Now, normally what we do is the API in solve would come through through the vertical inlet. The flow rates here for an AXF1 are normally controlled via gear pumps. Um, for the smaller equipment, the AXF Mini I mentioned earlier, that can be done with just syringe pumps. Whereas here, so your API in solvent is controlled via the vertical point. Your anti-solvent is controlled via the horizontal point. And this is essentially how they intermix. API in solvent is injected through the pores, mixes with the anti-solvent, it's controlled, the introduction is controlled through the pores, through the flow rate, to control the micro-mixing in order to get the desired outcome that you desire. So here are a few studies where we've actually used our technology with a variety of APIs to test everything, that, you know, crystallization, what do you want? You know, if you were the customer, what do you want to control? The first is crystallinity, which is um, one part, maybe do you want highly crystalline material or amorphous material? Again, I think amorphous has been mentioned several times in other talks. Again, amorphous crystallinity, um, sorry, a, the amorphous phase has far higher solubility than the crystalline phase, so because it is less thermodynamically stable. A lot of pharmaceutical companies are interested in that, so that's a key thing to target. And what we did is a comparison, a crystallization experiment using our AXF1 compared to a simple batch experiment. And what we found here with some nice SEM imaging is that the AXF1 continuous experiment was able to produce purely amorphous material, whereas the batch, again, you're probably not going to see this now due to circumstances, but it's got amorphous material with loads of crystalline needles embedded within the amorphous material. And if you can't see that, what we can instead show you is the X-ray diffraction data, which is a very good way of showing the differences. So the AXF, so I, in my years working as a crystallographer, I always work with crystalline materials. My professional sort of explanation of the amorphous is you have a hump. Low intensity, you know, blob, there's not really much distinctiveness, it's amorphous. Whereas with the batch being a mixture, you do have these peaks, these here, which are indicative of the crystalline needles, but there's a broadness as well as low intensity, which does show it is a mixture of the amorphous and the crystalline phase. So other study points we've looked at. Reproducibility. Again, if we've got a um, piece of equipment that's working on a pilot plant scale, you're going to want to make sure having these large-scale outputs, that reproducibility of results is key. So for this one, this case study, we use paracetamol. Again, after last night's drinks, I'm sure many of you know that API very well from this morning. And um, one of the things we studied, again, showing the flexibility of what we've been studying here is that this actually has very, a very crystalline, so diamond-like crystals. So it's not just amorphous, we can do very crystalline materials as well. 
And our main aim is looking at the size of these crystals. And what we found is through repeated studies, we are getting very similar particle sizes as being produced, which again is what many people are interested in. The control of the morphology, so the shape of the crystals. This is also important from a manufacturing point of view when you've got things like packing density, flowability. One of the main problems pharmaceutical companies have is that they get needles. People really don't want needles because they break, they can agglomerate. And what we've been able to do is through one of these APIs, Predlisolone, is through the addition of polymers, PVA and HPMC, we've actually been able to control the crystallization process to get different shapes. Here we've used, as I said, PVA, HPMC, and Pluronic P123, all organic polymer-based additives. And through these, we've been actually able to get a variety of different shapes of the same API, Predisolone. We've been able to get rods, diamonds, and hexagonals. Again, different shapes, which is going to affect the packing of this material, as well as the reactivity of these materials. Again, all through just simply using a different polymer additive. Polymorphism, another important point. Again, the same API trying to tailor what exactly the outcome will be. Again, many pharmaceutical companies will prefer Form 2 over Form 1 of the same API, and it can be very difficult via conventional methods to favor one over the other, especially if one's more dynamically stable. And this, through simply changing the surfactant, we were able to control if we got either the Form 2 or the Form 1 of carbamazepine. Again, via the same methodology, simply changing the type of surfactant. Now, another point that was brought up, so yesterday we were discussing about um, solid inhalation type uh, work that's been carried out. And one of these materials here, which is betametazone, this is actually a nasal spray, which is used uh, for arthritis. And what's good for getting these type of crystals is trying to make them as small as possible. And through formulation design with our equipment, again, we've been able to go sub-micron, so on the nanoscale of crystals. Again, showing we, it's not just the micron. We can reach nanocrystals as well, as well as nanoparticles. Again, this has also been backed up of what other sectors have done at Micropore for lipid, um, nanolipid particles. Well, again, we can also get nanocrystals. Now, here's a nice little case study. So this was one of the first experiments we did in order to test our scalability as well as batch to continuous, that big debate. So here we have our laboratory dispersion cell equipment. Now, again, this is batch equipment that we use, but it has the same principle with regards to a stainless steel membrane. Here at the base, that's where we have our membrane plate, which sits there. It's used to introduce the API and solvent, which is injected at the base, comes through into the glass cylinder, which is full of anti-solvent with a continuous stirrer. Again, even though we want to move towards continuous, batch processing will always still have a place, especially in R&D and academic fields. So we compared this simple, same setup, we simply removed the membrane and found that during the crystallization, the massive difference in sizing, again, going from 114D90 to 26, you know, a difference of about a factor of four, simply by removing a membrane. What also important is as well is that the previous four, as I showed to you before, which was amorphous and semi-crystalline, also came from these types of experiments, simply by removing a membrane. So the scalability studies here, um, this is the data that we got from the uh, AXF1 of the, the uh, API, Telmasartan. Um, some of these values um, here show that we're getting around 16 microns eventually. That was just a bit of trial and testing. But we were able to, once we got this value, compare this to the LDC result and show we were in very, very close agreement to what we got on a smaller scale batch processing. And again, this is showing that not only can we scale up, we can also go from batch to continuous whilst producing similar results. And again, also a very nice picture here, which is showing in the broadness as well. So it's not just about size, size distribution as well. You know, with these results, we're always getting a narrow size distribution, we're not getting anything broad, which can cause problems with blockages and so forth. So other tests we do, again, the crux of this is all about the solvent and the anti-solvent. Here we looked at how the changing of the rates can actually affect crystal sizing, which is our main concept of interest. Again, if you increase the, anti -sol the API in solvent, increase its speed, it actually shows that it increases the crystal size for this particular drug. 
This is because that as you're increasing the solvent flow rate, it moves out of the system faster. And as it's moving faster, the concentration is lower during the mixing process. Interestingly enough, when we increase the anti-solvent, this actually gives you a much smaller crystal sizes. Now, the reason for this is that this particular drug, telmacine, is immensely insoluble in the anti-solvent that we used. In fact, I think I used 0.3 milligrams, and it was still um, insoluble in 50 ml of water. So it's incredibly insoluble. And that's why when you increase the anti-solvent, it actually shrinks because it immediately crystallizes, and the more anti-solvent, the more rapid the precipitation is, is achieved. Now, the pore di diameter. So again, I've talked about how the crux of our technology is in using a membrane with pores. Again, how you can change the pore sizes in order to get the desired outcome which you prefer. And in this case here, we charged a variety of sizes. And again, increasing the pore size actually resulted in larger crystals. The reason being is as your API in solvent, the, the flow rate is exactly the same. As you're increasing the pore size, you, you're actually, the pore velocity is actually decreasing. Again, it's like if you're blowing into a, a straw or something. If you, you shorten the straw, shorten the diameter, the actual flow rate of your breath increases. And this is actually what's causing the effect. As it's becoming larger, the pore velocity is decreasing, means there's less material, which is resulting in larger sizes. So to finally conclude and wrap this up, Micropore Technologies has combined the concept of reverse antisolvent crystallization with that of our membrane micro technology. A combination of both has been aimed towards controlled, continuous crystallization, and this has been applied for a variety of APIs, different solubilities, different applications and purposes. And the aim has been to control a variety of different outcomes from the size and size distribution, morphology, crystallinity, again showing the variability that we can offer for anyone's different needs. Finally, I would like to wrap up and say thank you very much for listening to my talk, despite the problems, and here are some lovely images of crystals that will hopefully cheer you up. Thank you. This is, I assume, predominantly used in R&D, but yeah. more and more going into more commercial production? Absolutely. Yeah. So we have already done some work for an Indian client whom, um, so they're adopting what we prefer, which is where you um, either get us to do service work for you, or we, you, we sell you one of our lab-based equipments, which we successfully sold. The it was an LDC one, because at the time the AXF Mini wasn't out yet. They're happy with the results, and the aim is now going towards an, um, an AXF one, a much larger scale. So, yes, it is breaching out into the commercial, yes. Very good. Any questions from the... Thank you. Um, well done, by the way. That was not an easy thing to do with all the disruption. So we were all with you every step of the way. But... Um, Actually, I'm, I'm coming on next, and I suspect that a weakness of our technology is a strength of yours. Um, what's the smallest amount of material that you can crystallize with? Crystallize with? Oh, that is a very, very good question. Um, in the terms of the concentration that I've used, the smallest concentration I used was 0.4 milligrams per mil. That's what I've used so far. But again, it all depends as well on the formulation. Um, you know, if, as long as your material, when it comes into the anti sump will still be insoluble and you can form a solid that can be viewed and analysed, it, it, it's limitless. Like I said before, we're actually doing work with um, lipid nanoparticles, mRNA, incredibly expensive, so we do use incredibly small amounts when we're doing R&D testing. So it's... I don't know if virtually limitless is the right term, but again, with the right formulation, the only thing that's stopping you is your, the sensitivity of your analytical equipment. So if, if Pfizer were to come to you and say, look, you know, um, could you do a crystallization screen on 500 milligrams of material, could you do that? I would certainly say so, yes. We've definitely done um, crystallization on similar sizes. How many crystallization experiments we could do, that might take some time to decide, yeah. but we could definitely do at least one with that. Matthew, could you say a little bit more about um, factors affecting solvent selection? 
So what we normally do is, um, when you say solvent section, do you mean both the anti-solvent and the solvent? Yeah. So what we, the parameters that have to be assured is that the API is, is insoluble in the anti-solvent, be it completely or have very low solubility. Having said that, we have worked with systems where the um, API has not been insoluble in the anti-solvent, but is poorly soluble. I know you think, what is the difference? In practice, there is actual differences, but that has been one um, thing we've come across. Another thing is making sure that the solvent and anti-solvent are miscible. They must be mixing together, so not an oil and water. They must be perfectly miscible is one of the main things. Again, what also helps is that the more soluble your API in solvent is, the better. We have worked with systems where we have tried to increase the API concentration in the solvent, again, for industry purposes. They want to make as much product as they can. And that can, it can be problematic. However, it can easily be solved with simply heating up the API in solvent to get full dissolution. But again, that's one of the main things, making sure they're perfectly miscible, and it all depends on the interaction with the API. And, and do you know do you know what you're supposed to be working with ahead of time, or is that part of the? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, sure. Do you know what the solvent and anti-solvent are going to be when you start, or is that is the selection part now, of the process? That depends really on how R and D and how commercial it is. When we've come up with working with customers, they may give us a formulation where they're very rigid and say we have you have to use this, you have to make this work. And if that's the case, then we have to do some tinkering about either with the API concentration, either with temperature, and so forth and so forth. Sometimes when it comes to working, again, the general things to look at, the main thing to look at is solubility, making sure your API is as soluble in the solvent and as insoluble in the anti-solvent and that the liquids are miscible. They're the main parameters. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, it's fascinating, I have to say. So it's uh, certainly different from the times at university when we tried to crystallize our things in the beaker. Any other questions? No, then thank you very much oh, again. So, sorry, we've got one more. Oh, sorry. 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 We haven't tried co-crystallization, no, that is on the agenda, but what we have actually done is, and we can say this now, it's on the website, we have tried reaction chemistry using this system, where we have reagents in both sides to make a desired product. So we have actually used that to make it um, inorganic excipients. So that's one thing we have tried. So this expands from simple API recrystallization to reaction chemistry as well.